What's up everybody? In this tutorial, you are gonna see how we're gonna code deep deterministic policy gradients in TensorFlow to teach an agent how to walk in the bipedal walker environment. You don't need any prior experience. You don't really need to know anything about deep reinforcement learning. You just have to be able to follow along. Grab a drink, grab a snack, cause it might be a long video. Let's get started. So as usual, we start with our typical imports. We will need OS for file joining operations when we do model saving. Of course, we're gonna need TensorFlow. We will need NumPy to handle NumPy type stuff. And from TensorFlow uh, initializers, we will need a particular type of initializer, which is random uniform. Now, if you haven't seen my prior video on how to go from a paper to an implementation of DD deep deterministic policy gradients, I highly recommend you check that out. It's a couple hours, but it teaches you everything you need to know to implement deep learning papers. So I'm gonna kind of gloss over stuff in this particular video as I explained myself pretty well on that one, uh, but we need several classes. So uh, in all deep reinforcement learning problems, we have to deal with something called the explore exploit dilemma. That means how often do you take a good action versus how often you take an exploration action. We handle that with something called uh, an action noise. In this case, it's called OU, as in Ornstein Uhlenbeck. It's a type of noise that models Brownian motion, um, which is the motion of particles in a lossless liquid under the influence of collisions with other particles moving at random. It will be characterized by a mu, a sigma, with a default, default value of 0 0.15, a theta of 0 0.2, a dt as in differential with respect to time, d, uh, one by 10 to the minus two, and an initial value of none to begin with. Now this dt, you may guess from it being there, but what it means is that these, um, no, these noise terms are gonna be correlated in time. So it is a temporally correlated noise and you'll see how we accomplish that momentarily. So of course you wanna save all of your parameters in the respective member variables of your class. And at the top of the function, we're gonna call something called reset. What that will do is set the previous value for the noise. So the first thing we wanna do is define the uh, function to actually get the noise out of the object. And we're gonna override the call function. If you're not familiar with this, this allows you to say noise equals OU action noise, right? Just as you would to instantiate an object. But then you want to say my noise equals noise. It allows you to use the uh, parentheses to actually uh, get the noise instead of having a function called get noise. We just override the call function. So the noise will be equal to the previous value plus theta times self dot mu minus self dot x previous times the differential with respect to time. Uh, plus sigma times the square root of the dt uh, factor times numpy random normal with size equal to self dot mu dot shape. Then of course you wanna set x previous to x to help create your temporal correlations and return x. The reset function takes no arguments and this is where we're gonna set x previous that's equal to x not if x not is not none, else it will be a num, uh, numpy zeros like array and shape self dot mu. And so what this does is it creates temporally correlated noise that is uh, a random normal distribution characterized by a theta, mu, and a previous value, as well as a standard deviation, sigma. And mu is, of course, the mean. So the next thing we need is a class to handle our replay buffer. So uh, in deep Q learning, the agent uses a buffer of stored transitions. So every time it encounters a state, it takes an action, receives a reward and observes the new state. It stores that information away in its memory so that later on it can access a random subset of those memories that are non-sequential to update its estimate for the value action value function. And we, in DDPG are gonna do the same thing because DDPG combines the um, the innovations of deep Q learning with the power of the actor critic method. So the first thing we're gonna need, or rather next thing we're gonna need is the replay buffer. 
And you may have seen this if you've seen my other videos on DeepQ Learning. I typically would put this in the actual agent class itself, but I am just kind of uh, refining my approach over time and putting it in its own class so that we can reuse it for other projects as well. So our constructor will take the max size, which determines uh, what the maximum size of the memory is, the shape of the observations, as well as the number of actions. So of course you want to save your member variables. This memory counter is the running index of the last stored memory. And other implementations of the replay buffer, we use something called the DQ. It's a built-in Python data structure. It's perfectly valid to use that. I use NumPy arrays of zeros. I like to pre-allocate my memory. That way I can make sure I'm not going to run out of space uh, in my RAM, that is. Um, and we can accomplish the same thing with NumPy arrays. So that's just how I prefer to do it. If you use the DQ um, object, that is perfectly fine as well. So the state memory is just going to be in shape memory size. So the total number of memories by the uh, number of uh, vectors in the input state, which for the Walker 2D environment is 24. It's a 24 element vector. So we're also going to need a new state memory, which is basically the same size. And that is the states that are encountered after the agent steps the environment with its action. Speaking of which, we will want an array of action memories as well. And that will have mem size by number of actions. We also need a reward memory. And that just keeps track of the re uh, rewards the agent receives. And that's a scalar quantity, so it just gets shape mem size. And also, we want something called a terminal memory. So each time the agent steps, it receives a done flag from the environment that tells the agent whether or not it has entered the terminal state. The terminal state is a special state in deep reinforcement learning because after the terminal state, no further states follow. And that's important. It may sound trivial, but it's important because it means that the reward for the next state is identically zero. So when we sample this buffer, we're going to be sampling memories from non-adjacent spaces generally because it's going to be a really large memory. It's possible to have two consecutive memories, but in general, they will probably not be consecutive. We don't want them to be consecutive because we get correlations between successive states, right? Because they occurred in the same episode. And these correlations tend to cause the agent to get bogged down in its training because it gets lost in one particular part of parameter space. You know, it can get lost in one little uh, false op, one uh, local minima instead of the global minima, which is hard enough to find if you don't get, you know, especially if you get caught in the local minima. So the, uh, the agent will be sampling the subset of memories. And so if the, the next state could very well be from the, uh, another episode from a totally different series of games, but you don't want it to take that into account if this step it just took resulted in a terminal state. So that's a long-winded way of saying that the terminal state means you get zero reward. And you have to have a way of keeping track of that, and that is through the array of NumPy zeros in shape of mem size. And we're going to be pedantic here and make sure it's NumPy float 32. I believe this is to maintain uh, consistency with my PyTorch implementation of DDPG because PyTorch is pretty particular about the types of tensors you pass it. Uh, TensorFlow isn't quite as particular. So this is just for consistency so that you can use this class with both the TensorFlow and PyTorch implementations of DDPG on my GitHub. So now we need a function to store a transition. And then I'll take a state action reward, a new state, we'll call state underscore, and done. So the index is going to be self.memory counter modulus self.memory size. So what this will do is it will loop around as we, uh, as we overwrite the end of the buffer. So the buffer will have 1 million possible entries in it. So when we get to 1 million and 1, it'll go back around to position 0. And that's what the modulus accomplishes. Um, sorry, it'll go back to state 1. Uh, at 1 million, it'll go back to 0. My, my bad. So, so state memory, we want to store the new state at position index, like so. And we want to do the same thing for all of our memories. 
Now when we get to the terminal memory, that's when things get a little bit different. So here, instead of just being done, we want one minus done. And the reason is that we are going to be multiplying by this flag from the terminal memory. And so if we just have done, when the episode is over, it'll be true, right? And true evaluates to one, and so you'll be multiplying the next state by one, which will take it into account. It's the exact opposite behavior of what we want, so we have to say one minus done. Now, I'll remind you of this when we get back down into the learning function because it's easy to forget. I got a number of questions on this on my other videos, uh, but we take care of the one minus done up here. And the next thing we need to do is increment our memory counter so we keep track of however many memories we have stored. Next, we need a function to sample the buffer, and that'll take batch size as input because we only want to sample a subset. And what we want to do is uh, we want to know what is the last occupied memory. So if, remember, we've initialized these with zeros, and so if we sample from the total subset, the, total, the totality of all the memories, before we've written anything to them, we'll be sampling a bunch of zeros, which doesn't tell the agent anything useful. So we have to know the position of the last stored memory, so that way we can only sample up to that position. So we'll call it the minimum of self.memoryCounter or self.mem size. So if memory counter is less than the memory size, we'll return that. If the memory counter is larger than mem size, we don't want to return memory counter, we want to return the mem size, because remember we're wrapping around for a finite size memory. Right, so the mem counter is larger than mem size, if you return the max then you'll get something which will um, give you the wrong answer basically. So now we need to take the batch, which is going to be the random choice of range max mem in batch size. So this will return batch size by uh, an array of length batch size where the uh, members are integers of from zero all the way up to max memory. And then all we have to do is index our arrays and say states uh, self.state memory sub batch new states New state memory sub batch actions action memory rewards reward memory and terminal. <laughs> it would help if I could type right. Terminal memory sub batch, and then when we're done, all we want to do is just return states actions rewards new states and terminal. And that is it for our sample buffer class. So as I said, what this, a replay buffer, what this does is it just keeps track of the states, actions, and rewards and it samples them at random. So now we're ready to move on to the actor critic type functions. So if you have seen my videos on DeepQ Learning, I will occasionally use a single deep network class and then derive the uh, target and evaluation networks from as instances of a, that class. But in this case, the actor and critic are very different in their network architecture, so they each get their own class. So let's start with the actor. And in TensorFlow, we don't have to derive from any particular base class of TensorFlow. We just derive the class from object. And our constructor is going to take a whole bunch of parameters. So the learning rate, number of actions, a network name. This is to handle uh, scoping, so that way we have different um, different names of layers for all of our different networks. You're going to find that we have four networks instead of just one or two. And so things can get a little bit confusing on the graph. We want everything to have its own distinct name. Input dimensions. We're going to want to pass in the session to the actor rather than giving the actor its own session. We're going to want the dimensions for the first and second fully connected layers. Now, some environments have an action bound that is not one, so we're going to bound the actions with an activation function by plus or minus one, but some environments have a action bound of two, and so if you're lopping it off at plus or minus one, you're going to miss out on half the action space, and so we want to take into account the action bounds uh, within the actor class itself, and that'll just come from the environment, which you will see at the end. 
we want a directory to save. We also want a directory to save our checkpoints. And that is because the deep deterministic policy gradient algorithm takes a long time to run and you want to be able to checkpoint it frequently because learning can be a little bit chaotic meaning that sometimes it can go off a cliff so we want to checkpoint frequently and that's accommodated through the checkpoint directory we want to go ahead and save our parameters as usual Uh, check pointer equals point directory input dims input dims uh, we'll need a batch size as well of course you want to save the tensorflow section you want the action boundaries as well now that we have all of our fancy stuff, we want to call the build network function, which will go ahead and load up our network architecture onto the graph. Once you have built the network though, it'll return and you want to call the params. And the reason we want to do this is because we're going to use a soft parameter copy. So what that means is in say deep Q learning, we have an evaluation and a target network where the uh, the target network is overwritten every n turns with the variables, with the parameters from the evaluation network. And so you're only really training one network and then dumping the parameters from that onto another network. Uh, here, we're going to be doing that as well, but instead of doing a hard copy of the exact values, we're going to be doing some multiplicative factor with respect to those parameters. And we'll get to that momentarily. But in order to do that, you need the actual parameters from your trainable variables, making sure to call scope equals self dot name. That's so that you don't try to overwrite the, uh, say, critic network with the actor parameters, which would be a disaster. It actually wouldn't even work because the networks are totally different. So. We also want a saver function that is going to be used to save the model, most important. And our OS, our sorry, our checkpoint file is going to be given by OS path.join, checkpoint directory, name plus underscore ddpg dot checkpoint. So every agent, sorry, every network will get its own set of uh, files to save its parameters. And now that I'm looking at this, I don't really need to save the checkpoint directory because I just call it there so that's fine so that's all well and good the next thing we need to worry about is how we're gonna do the calculation of the back propagation and the gradients so if you take a look at my video on how I implemented uh, the paper I go into more depth on this but basically we're gonna calculate the gradients of the critic with respect to the actions that the actor took and we also want to calculate the gradient of the uh, probability distribution mu with respect to the uh, parameters, self.params. So we're going to need to calculate all of that, and we're going to do it manually, the hard way, uh, because it's kind of most instructive. Uh, I don't know. So self-unormalized un <laughs> actor gradients, and that's going to be a TensorFlow gradients instance with values self.mu, self.params, and something called self.negative, negative self.action gradient. And that'll be the gradient with respect to the actions. We will calculate that presently. Self.actor gradients is going to be a list that maps a lambda function. What we're gonna do here is normalize basically by dividing x by batch size, and that will be self.unnormalized actor gradients. And our optimize function will be an atom optimizer. We need a period in there, and that will use self.learning rate, and we're going to apply the gradients we have just calculated. Now apply gradients requires an iterator, so we'll pass in a zip 
of actor gradients and self dot params. So here we have calculated the uh, actor gradients. Uh, we will calculate that in the actual critic uh, class, and we have passed that into the um, the atom optimizer. So it will it will take the derivative of the of uh, of the network with respect to the parameters. Next we can actually get to building our network architecture. That takes no parameters. And TensorFlow has this context manager for the T, uh, TensorFlow variable scope. That's so that everything below this within that context will have the uh, name self.name. And that's how we're going to facilitate the naming of different layers based on whether they are the target actor, actor, target critic, or critic networks. Yes, we're going to have four deep networks. This is an incredibly computationally expensive algorithm, but it's the only one we have, at least that I've implemented so far, that deals with uh, continuous action spaces. So, hey, beggars can't be choosers, right? So we need a placeholder for our input. That'll be float32. And this will, of course, be the observations from the environment. Shape gets none by self dot input dims. And um, if you're not familiar with that idiom shape equals a list where the first element is none, it means that we're going to pass in a batch of unknown size. And you have to do it that way because when you calculate the um, when you calculate an action, you're going to pass in a single observation. Whereas when you do the learning, you're going to pass in the batch size of, of observations so you can't just put self dot batch size otherwise you need a separate variable to calculate the uh, action to take It'd be incredibly unwieldy we also need a placeholder for the action gradient and that's another 32-bit floating number of shape none by and actions and that will get a very creative name of gradients. Uh, that's it for our placeholder variables. Next up, we have to think about the actual network architecture. So we're not going to use any convolutions because we're just going to be passing in a vector of 24 elements. So we're going to have just fully connected layers. And uh, per the original video I did on implementing the paper, we have to instantiate uh, sorry, we have to initialize these layers with some values, and those will be 1 divided by the square root, numpy square root of the fan in. So fan in is just a number of input dimensions. And so our first layer is dense. tf.layers.dense takes self.input as input, has fc1 dims for our units. And it needs a kernel initializer and lies er equals a random uniform form and from minus f1 to positive f1. We also need a bias initializer. And that's another random uniform from minus f1 to f1. And if you don't know where that random uniform came from, if we scroll up we can see it is a TensorFlow initializer. So that's why we did that. Scrolling back down. So in this particular network, we're going to want to use batch normalization. And this is for network stability. Uh, it also helps with generalization because many of the environments will have parameters that can vary across um, many orders of magnitude, you know, one to two orders of magnitude. Uh, a fact which is uh, to which many neural networks are quite sensitive. So. We're going to want to perform batch normalization to normalize those inputs so they're scaled, uh, as well as to allow us to tackle many different environments with this one particular network. And that'll be a not a dense, but a batch normalization. And finally, we want to activate. Now, it is an open debate whether or not you want to perform the batch normalization before or after the activation. I fall in the camp of doing it after. Uh, you could try it before. I've did it this, done it this way, and it works, so I don't change it. 
So we also want to take into account the initialization of the next layer. And that is not 1 over NumPy square root self.fc2 dims. I didn't pick this out of thin air. This comes from the paper. Uh, they may have picked it out of thin air, although I doubt it. I'm sure they had a reason. But that's where I get it. So we have another layer. And that takes uh, layer 1 activation as input with self.fc2 dims as a number of units. And I'm going to uh, just go ahead and copy this taking care to change F1 to F2. Once again, we want to do batch normalization. That, of course, takes dense 2 as input, and uh, we want to activate that as well with a value. Finally, we want our output layer, and this gets a constant initialization of 0 0.003, and we will call this mu. Uh, mu is the nominally the probability distribution for the agent's policy. However, in this case, it is deterministic, as you might be clued in by the name, deep deterministic policy gradients. And so instead of outputting a probability, the probability is just one, and we are outputting the actual action the agent takes. So mu is just a vector of length action space, uh, the same shape of the action space, and it will vary between the low and upper bounds of the uh, environment's action space. And that is, of course, a dense layer. It takes dense, uh, layer 2 activation as input with uh, n actions for the units. Now this one we will activate right here, and that will have a tanch hyperbolic tangent hyperbolic activation and let me go ahead and copy these initializers because this gets initialized as well and of course that gets initialized between plus minus F3 instead of F2 of course and finally self.mu is just TF multiply mu with the action bound and so the reason we do this, again, is because some environments have action spaces which are bound by plus or minus 2, let's say. And here, by using a tangent hyperbolic activation, we are bounding it by plus or minus 1. Uh, so we want to have this final step to make sure that we don't miss out on any possible actions for any given environment. And for an environment in which the uh, tangent hyperbolic would be fine, this will be just, just be multiplying by 1, so we don't really lose anything in that case. Next, we want a function to actually feed forward the network, in other words, to get a prediction. And that will return self.session.run self.mu the feed dictionary of self.input inputs. So this will just send the inputs all the way through the network through f1, f2, and self.mu. And it will return that value. Next, we want the train function. And that will take the inputs and the gradients as input. You again want to do the session.run with the uh, running the optimize operation. And we want a separate feed dictionary that takes self.input inputs and self.actor, no, action gradient gradients. So this will perform the optimization step with the uh, inputs from our replay buffer as well as the action gradients that will be calculated in the learning function using the outputs of the critic class, which you'll see in a little bit. So two more functions for the actor, and these are just bookkeeping. A low checkpoint function and this will call saver.restore self.session self.checkpoint file. <clears throat> and so what that does is it loads the session from the checkpoint file and sticks it onto the current session. Pretty straightforward. The save checkpoint file is basically the same thing but the opposite. So print saving checkpoint self.saver.save self.session 
and self.check point file. And so this will just take the current session and load it in or save it into the checkpoint file. And that is it for our actor class. Not too complicated, just a few uh, dense neural network layers and some mojo with the gradients that were calculated uh, by the critic. And so if that's mysterious to you, go ahead and check out my other video. I explain it more in detail there. I just don't want to have, uh, you know, a super two super long videos. You know, it's going to be long enough. So next we need the critic. And that gets its own learning rate, number of actions, a name, input dims, a session. It's the constructor is effectively the same as the uh, actor class, and in fact, check point dir equals temp slash edpg. In fact, I'm just going to go ahead and copy this because. That is all we need. So copy this and paste it there. And uh, this is no problem because the name is something we will pass in through the agent function. So that's no big deal. And next up, we want the optimize operation. And we're going to use the atom optimizer again. And that will you uh, optimize the uh, using the learning rate and we want to minimize the agent's loss or the critic's loss sorry we also need the action gradients spelled correctly of course and that will get a couple of placeholders as input so we will define those in a minute right here right now in our build network function. And again, we want to use the uh, TF variable scope uh, context manager. And of course, we have an input placeholder. And shape none by input dims. And we'll also give that a name just to be clear. Now, you don't have to worry that this is called inputs as well as this up here because these are on separate uh, context managers, so they will have different names based upon the name of the particular network. Self.actions is another placeholder. And it will get shape none by number of actions and another creative name of actions. Now we want QTarget and this may be reminiscent of uh, QLearning because it is. Uh, it's fairly similar. Uh, you'll see when we get to learning but the shape is batch size by one because it's a scalar quantity and the name is just targets. Perfect. So uh, now the network is actually very, very similar to the actor. So I'm going to go up and copy some of it with the caveat that I will change it as appropriate. So I want to minimize keystrokes. So uh, the first layer, the input layer, is the same. And we do batch normalization there. The second layer is the same, but we're not going to do activation. Uh, and the reason is that we want to actually incorporate the actions. So if you recall, QLearning, it, it uses the state action value function, which has states and actions in it. Here we've only inputted the states uh, through the inputs, right? That is shape input dims, which comes from our environment. So we need to take into account the agent's actions as well. And as per the paper, we only take that into account at the end of the network. We don't feed it forward from the very beginning. So we need a new layer called action in and it's a dense layer uh, it'll take self.actions as input uh, and it has self.fc2 dims as number of units and this gets a ReLU activation now next thing we have to do is take into account both the states and the actions so we'll say state actions will be the addition of batch 2 and action in and then 
we want to do the somewhat kludgy step of activating that. Now, this is totally up for debate. So uh, what I've done here, if you're paying attention, is that I've activated the actions here and then I have activated the sum of the actions and the batch normalized states. Now this is somewhat questionable because the ReLU function is non-commutative with respect to addition. That means that if you perform addition before ReLU, you get a different answer by than if you perform ReLU and then addition. Uh, so, you know, is this debatable? It is certainly debatable, but you saw at the beginning of the video that it teaches the walker to walk, so it works, and so I've left it this way. But I encourage you to fork this and play with this on your own machine and see if you can get it to work even better. Please do so. That would make my day. Okay, so now we need to take care of the last layer and that gets uh, initialized with 0 .003, same as, a, as in the actor. But instead of being mu, it's actually q. And it's a dense layer that takes state actions as input has a single unit, remember, because we're trying to learn the action value function, which is a scalar quantity. And I'm going to copy the two initializers from up here just to be lazy. But we're going to have one other thing to take care of as well. So we need a comma. And the other thing we have to take care of is um, kernel regularization. So uh, in the paper, they use L1 reg or sorry L2 regularization, so that is what we're going to do as well. Ularizer equals Keras regularizers dot L2, and it gets a value of 0 0.01. That's just per the paper. I didn't decide that they did, uh, and it works, so we will use it. So there is our Q, and finally our loss function is going to be losses mean squared error self.q target and self.q and of course q target will be the values we calculate in the uh, training the uh, learning function for the agent uh, and it'll be very reminiscent of deep q learning next we need a prediction function and that takes inputs and actions as input right because we uh, have to take into account the actions right here in the action in layer so we're going to want to return self.session.run self.q with a feed dictionary of self.input inputs and self.actions actions perfect so we also need a function to handle training that takes the inputs, actions, and Q target. Right, we need to supply everything that we need to do the full uh, optimization step. So you want to return self.session.run, uh, self.optimize with a feed dictionary of self.input, inputs, self.actions, actions. Oof, and self dot q target q <laughs> q target perfect <laughs> okay so that's a training function a few others we need the get action gradients and that will take inputs and actions as input and we want to return self dot session dot run self dot action gradients with a feed dictionary of self dot inputs no input inputs and self dot actions actions okay so that is all we need and finally for the critic class we want the um, save and load checkpoint functions which are identical to the actor so I'll just copy them Awesome. So now we are done with the critic class, the actor class, replay buffer, and the OU action noise. Now we need to tie it all together in the agent. Now this initializer is kind of complicated. We'll need alpha, which is learning rate for our actor, beta, learning rate for our critic, input dims, 
tau. Now, tau is a multiplicative factor for the soft update of the network parameters. As I said above, we're not doing a hard update where we just copy the parameters from one network to another. We're going to multiply this by some parameter tau and update using that value. So we need that parameter. We need to pass in the environment to get the action bound. A gamma of 0 0.99. Again, gamma is the discount factor for the agent's calculation of the Bellman equation. It tells it by how much to discount future rewards. And it varies between 0 and 1, and it's almost always 0 0.95 or 0 0.9 up to 0.99. Number of actions equal 2 by default. Uh, many environments just have 2. Max size, this is the size of our replay buffer, and that's 1 million. Layer 1 size, 400. Layer 2 size of 300. I got those from the paper as well. A batch size of 64. Checkpoint directory of temp slash gdpg. So you want to save all of your relevant parameters. And you want to instantiate a replay buffer. Max size, input dims and actions. We want to save the batch size. It's not batch minus size, batch underscore size, of course. We need the session, and that is a TensorFlow session, as you would expect. What we're going to do here is instantiate a single session and pass it to all four networks, which we will define now. So our actor, which we will use to calculate the actions, is an actor that gets alpha and actions, a name of actor, is actions, that's not right, and actions, actor, input dims, self.session, uh, the layer one size, layer two size, env action space dot high, and checkpoint dir equals checkpoint dir. Now the critic is very similar, except it's a critic class. We don't want to capitalize that. It takes beta. The name is critic. We don't need the action space, but we do need everything else. So let's go ahead and do that. Now. I alluded to it earlier, but didn't explicitly state we're going to have four networks. There will be a target actor as well as a target critic in addition to the actor and critic. This kind of leverages the magic of deep Q learning. And what this does is uses uh, target networks to uh, prevent the problem of updating your, of using the same network for uh, both calculating an action as well as calculating the value of that action. In other words, it prevents maximization, maximization bias. So we'll call it target actor, and it gets a new name of target actor. And we will go ahead and properly format the code because that is actually important. I have uh, received high praise on gigs because I actually do that. So I would encourage you to follow the Pep8 style guide as well. Uh, it certainly couldn't hurt to make your code more legible. Um, and it will help you stand out in the workplace as well. And of course you want to call that target critic. Okay, so we have four networks. They're appropriately named. Next we need the noise. And this is an OU action noise. And mu is just numpy zeros in the shape number of actions. Um, Next, we need to do the update operations for updating the parameters uh, with the the updating the target networks with the regular networks. So we have to define that here. If you define it in a function for itself outside of the init function, then it actually slows down the program to a screeching halt every time you call the uh, every time you call the update network parameters. And I suspect that's because it's just adding operations to the graph repetitively and basically choking it up. So update critic gets its own operation, and that is a list comprehension. Self target uh, critic dot params sub i dot assign. Assign is the TensorFlow function for assigning one vector to another. 
TensorFlow, multiply, critic, param, sub i, multiplied by self.tau, and plus tf.multiply, self.target, critic, dot params, good grief, sub i, multiply one minus self.tau. I in range len of self dot target critic dot params. So then I need a one too many parentheses. And so what this will do is it will update the target critic params with the value of tau multiplied by the critic parameters plus one minus tau times the target critic parameters. And we want to do the same thing for the actor as well, or target actor, that is, update actor, target actor.params, self.actor.params, target actor, and target actor.params. Uh -huh, I believe that's it, perfect. Okay, so now we've done our updates. Now we wanna call the global variables initializer uh, basically what this will do is it'll initialize all of our random variables in our networks so our weights are initialized randomly of course and uh, we want to call at the very beginning we want to update the network parameters and we want to let it know that it's the first time we're doing that and that's because if you take a look at the paper at the very beginning, they start the target networks as having the same value for the parameters as the actual networks. And so the uh, update network parameters function takes a variable to let it know it's the first time it's doing it. So let's see how that works. So if first we want to save tau, and there's probably a better way of doing this. Uh, so we set tau to 1.0, target critic session run, self.update critic, and self.target actor.session.run, self.update actor, and set tau to be old tau. Otherwise, just call these two functions again. Oops. Awesome. Next, we need a function to store the transitions in the replay buffer memory. We'll call that remember. Takes state, action, reward, new state, and done. And as I said before, remember that done uh, is passed in from the environment. When we store the transition, we're going to store it as one minus done instead of just done. Dot store transition. Next, we need a function to choose an action. And that takes a state as input. So uh, since the um, placeholder has shape none by self dot input dims. If you try to pass in a vector of shape just input dims, it'll give you a dimensional mismatch. So we want to reshape the state uh, with a new axis just to give it uh, shape one by uh, number of observations. Self dot actor dot predict. That doesn't change anything, just the shape. And Next, we want to take uh, mu prime equals mu plus noise. Um, self dot noise, sorry. Self dot noise. That's why we overloaded the call function. And you want to return mu prime sub zero. And that's because this turns list of lists. So you want the zeroth element of that list. No big deal. Uh, we just define that. Let's call learn. So this is the heart of the problem. Um, now we have a choice. So uh, when we start playing the game, 
uh, the replay buffer is empty. And the question is, do we want to sample one memory 64 times? Probably not. Do we want to sample four memories 16 times? Probably not. What we want to do is we want to let the replay buffer fill up the batch size and then start sampling. So we'll say if self.memory.mem counter less than self.batch size return. And really, I should incorporate this into the um, I should incorporate this into the replay buffer class just to be more consistent with object-oriented programming. Uh, but you know, whatever. Uh, we aren't going to fret about that for now. Next, you want to sample that. Uh, done equals uh, self memory dot sample buffer match size. And then you want to perform feed forwards to get the relevant values. So we want to calculate the critic value underscore. So the value from the target critic of the new states, given the actions are equal to uh, whatever is dictated by the target actor for that set of new states. And it's new state, not new states. This again comes from the paper. Basically, you're 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 just doing two feed forwards in one step. Next, we want to calculate the Q targets. We're going to do this by brute force instead of a vectorized implementation because you need to be very very careful here. If you use the wrong vectorized implementation, you can get something of shape batch size by batch size, which will not uh, complain when you do the mean squared error loss because it's square, uh, but it doesn't give you the right answer. So. We're going to be completely pedantic and iterate over our memory manually. That's not self.critic value, it's just critic value underscore sub j times done sub j, where again done is one minus the done flag from the environment. And at the end, we want to reshape that because the Q target has shape. Uh, batch size by one. So reshape the target and shape self.batch size by one. Next, we want to uh, perform the critic training with the state, action, and target. And then we want to worry about our actor. So a ounce actor predict for the state. The grads are self.critic.getAction gradients state a ounce and self.actor.train state and grads. So what we're doing is we are getting the gradients from the critic, we're getting the values of the states from the actor, and using those to train the actor. Once we finish training both the actor and critic, we want to update network parameters. So we're going to be, uh, since this is a temporal difference method, we're going to be updating the target networks as well as doing a learning on each step. So that's at least in part why it's so computationally expensive. Next, we have two bookkeeping functions. These are an interface between the um, actor, the agent, and the actor and critic classes. And basically, all we're going to do is. S save the checkpoints target actor save checkpoint dot critic save checkpoint and then finally we want to load the models and that is pretty much the same thing but in reverse and so instead of load save checkpoint we're going to load And we'll call these periodically through the main training function. So, wow, that was a mouthful. We are about 314 lines in. Uh, not a whole lot of waste in there, so it's about 300 lines of, of code. Pretty, pretty dense stuff. Uh, probably the longest project we've done. Now all that remains is going over to the main function and testing this out. So, of course, 
you want to start with your imports. You want to import the agent from the stuff we just wrote. We want Jim. We want NumPy. Uh, we want um, my fancy plot learning function. And I didn't show learning plots for this because when I trained it, I trained it in sets of 5,000 games. Uh, and that is because it takes a long time. 5,000 games takes around 12 hours. So I trained it for about a day and a half to two days. I think it was 15 to 20,000 games to get the results that you saw. And it's still not completely there. Uh, solved score is 300, but it gets close enough. It's around 255. Pretty good. Pretty good stuff. And I'm also going to import OS. I don't know. We'll leave that out. Well, yeah, here. I'll show you something. I'll show you guys how to dictate which GPU your code runs on in TensorFlow. So let's do that. And that is, of course, only applicable if you have more than one. But hey, if you do, you're going to want to know how to do it. So you want to say OS.environment. This is an environment variable. Uh, so if you run Linux, it's like dollar environment variable, which is CUDA device order equals PCI bus ID. So this will get the bus IDs from the motherboard of your graphics cards and let the uh, device order know what it is. So then we say OS environ CUDA visible devices equals zero. And so this will put it on GPU zero with respect to whatever order it's put in by your PCI bus. And that's how you do, uh, that's how you specify which GPU models run on in TensorFlow. In a few weeks, I'll probably do a video on how to uh, reduce memory consumption by TensorFlow because TensorFlow hogs the entire <laughs> VRAM of the GPU uh, just to make sure it's got enough. Uh, whereas PyTorch doesn't do that, so clearly there is another way to do it. But I digress. Let's go ahead and make our environment bipedal walker v2. And we need our agent. That is an agent with an alpha of 0 0.1 by 10 to the minus 4, beta 0, 0, 001 with 10 to the minus 3, input dims of 24, a tau of 0 0.001, pass in the environment. And you know everything else except n actions is default. So the bipedal walker has four actions, and um, I'm not going to specify a checkpoint directory because we already have the default. Next up, we want to set the NumPy random seed. And the reason you want to do this is because this is an inherently probabilistic model, and you want to improve. Uh, repeatability or reproducibility and so you you facilitate that by seeding the random number generator so if you don't seed it it will use the system clock as a seed which so means that even if you come back and run it one millisecond later you're gonna get a different random number seed so best to pass in the zero to get some type of repeatability um, next up we if we want to load the model we would say agent load models Again, that's only if we have a saved agent. Uh, so we don't, let's say score history equals blank. I in range, let it play 5,000 games. I'm not actually gonna let it go that far. Reset the environment, reset your done flag, set your score to zero, and go ahead and play your episode. So while not done, act equals Agent dot choose action obs new state uh, reward done info emv step act and say agent dot remember state no it's obs sorry obs act reward new state and uh, done we'll pass int done and agent.learn keep track of your score uh, set your old state to be the new state and if you want to see what it looks like you can do env.render and at the end of every episode you want to say score history dot append score and print episode 
I score to F score um, and say trailing 100 games average percent dot to F percent I forgot a percent sign there percent numpy mean score history trailing 100 games onward if I modulus 25 equals zero so every 25 games agent dot save models and at the end of all the games file name equals bipedal dot png plot learning score history file name and window of 100. So as I said, I managed to get this up to a score around 255. Solved is 300 for the last 100 games. That's why I set the window to 100. Uh, we don't quite get there, but it is pretty darn close. So now that we have spent about an hour typing all that up, let's go ahead and head to the terminal and see how many typos I made. All right, so here we are. Moment of truth. I have an invalid syntax. That is in the file, line 134. Let's head there and see what we see. So it's on line 134. You scroll up. Uh, let us see, where have I forgotten something? Oh. <laughs> uh, let's see, so let's delete this. Yeah, it would help if I looked at the actual line it told me is wrong. So it's telling me there's an error on line 288. I forgot an equal sign. I see that already. Scroll down. Line 288. Critic value underscore equals. And let's go back. Try it again. Uh, let's see. Kernel. Initial Urzer. Uh, okay, yeah, that's why. So that's easy. Line 96. I forgot an I. Right here. Initial Izer. Yep. Does that mean I did it here as well? Yes. And I probably did it in the critic as well. There. There there and there that do it on F on layer 3 I did not alright let's try it again I did <laughs> uh, oh and the bias okay 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 oh I forgot I forgot a different eye that's funny I looked at it and didn't see it because I was looking for uh, a different eye that's Typical. Okay, so bias initializer. All right. Okay. Once more. Oh, come on, man. Did I hit Control Z and didn't know it? What is going on? Did I not save? What did I do? stroking out. All right, try it again. So now it's saying and it got an ex unexpected keyword argument checkpoint dir checkpoint dir in line 234, okay? All right, let's scroll down. Line 234 chk checkpoint dir that's in the critic Ah, I have a C. Do I CHK right here? Okay. Did I do that? I didn't do that in the critic or the actor? Apparently not. All right. Let's try it again. Once more. Name action bound is not defined. Oh, okay, that's easy. That's line 142. 
Oops. 142. That's because we don't need it. Of course. It's because I copied and pasted from the actor. I think I did that in the last video too. <laughs> All righty. Module TensorFlow. Oh, it's tf.losses. That's why. Has no attribute loss. No problem. That's in my critic. Self.loss, tf.losses. Yep. Let's go back. Ooh. Now it's unhappy about the scoping. Interesting. Well, I did just realize I have two checkpoint files, probably because I did a copy and paste and didn't realize I had copied and pasted it. So let's actually get rid of all of that. I don't think that'll fix it, but let's just make it clean. Oh, that's why. Ah, I see it. I see it. Ah, of course. So <laughs> that's the danger of copying and pasting. So that was a total total brain fart there so you can't build the network twice you can only do it one time so let's make sure I'm not doing anything else incredibly stupid alright that's why so let's go back to the terminal and see what's up perfect okay so choose actions is just choose action let's go to the main change that it's right here once more. Name inputs is not defined. That is in 202. Okay. It's because it's in, we'll call it inputs there. Did I do that anywhere else? I did not. Nope. Okay. 7,000th time is a charm, right? Ah. Finally, it works. <laughs> All right, so this thing won't actually start learning for 5,000 games or so, uh, but you saw at the beginning how the uh, bipedal, water actually, bipedal walker actually learns how to walk. It kind of stutter steps, but hey, it makes it all the way from the front to the end, so I call that a win in my book. Now I'm going to go ahead and upload my best model weights to the GitHub so you can download them, load them, and start training with them to see if you can improve on it. I would recommend using a smaller learning rate because they're already more or less trained. You want to go uh, in much smaller steps once you get kind of close to a good minimum. Uh, but yeah, go ahead and use this. Feel free to clone it. Investigate some of the things I told you about in the code. Any comments, questions, suggestions, leave them down below. If you found this video helpful, make sure to share. Uh, that helps me immensely. That helps me get discovered. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure to hit that bell icon so you get notified twice a week when I release a new video. And I'll see you all in the next video.